So, Mr. Satch Hoy, great to be in conversation with you, bro. Yes, Mr. Paul Griffin. Um, yeah, you too. Around this project, Afrosonic Mapping, that you've been working on for a number of years, I think since at least 2016. But of course, your practice and research on this area goes back, I can imagine, um, you know, through your musical work and uh, for your artwork, you know, goes well way back before then. But I guess, right. why, don't we, yeah. why don't we start this conversation um, with um, the research that kind of led into this project, the research around the um, archives. Yeah. yeah, so Paul, so your, your question was about the, um, the initial, the, 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 the yeah, well, initial I mean, yeah, launch into, 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 the, for this into, the, project, into the project. Exactly, and like, you know, Obviously, you were really, you know, let's, 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 before we get into the actual research you did in the archives, right, let's just talk about mm. a key concept that frames this whole project, which is the Afrosonic signifier. And you talk about the right. eternal return of the Afrosonic signifier. What is the Afrosonic yeah. sonic signifier, Satch? Yeah, the actual Afrosonic signifier is um, a mnemonic network. Of, of sounds that were um, carried over to the Caribbean basin and to the Americas with the enslaved peoples on the Black Atlantic. Um, and I argue that <coughs> this, this, this sonic signifier um, is one of the strongest elements that was able to keep um, African culture somewhat intact. And then that of course leads into the Africanization of, uh, of Christianity and also uh, the fact that in the hold there was people from many different cultures because we know there's so many different cultures in Africa like from border to border you know be before the scramble for Africa of course um, so a lot of people didn't speak the same language but there was this like whole sonic uh, linguistics going on and I, I also say that the, um, the actual hull of the ship it was like a drum and the, mm -hmm. of course I'm, I'm imagining a lot of this because you know as we all know mm. all colonial histories were written by the, the colonizer and not the colonized mm. Mm. but I'm imagining as well from being a musician and, and my, my experience in Africa that even the chains would have been percussion mm. Mm. and that th that is the the carrier you know in yeah. within that situation, as dire and as bi abysmal as it was, there was these th these genius genres of black music being created, even within that situation, and mm -hmm. that is what was being carried over to, as I say, the Caribbean basin and, and the Americas. Mm -hmm. No, that's thank you. That's a really beautiful explanation of that, Satch, and it it makes me think about the writer Edward Gleason, you know, who talks about the open boat. Yeah talks about traditional African boats or, you know, fishing vessels, which were open, yeah. right? Compared to right. the covered hull of a slave ship, which has a very different sonic, right? you know what I mean? There's like a, yeah. It's got a completely boat, different tonicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, compared to the yeah, open yeah, boat yeah. So, of traditional African communities where I guess the voice, people be singing, be very different. So it just makes your, your image there of the closed hull and the darkness and yeah. terror and the abyss of that compared to the open boat is, you know, incredible. Yeah, because, you know, in, in, those, in those ships, there was all of these rafters and each one of those rafters is a different note as well. So, I mean, the thing is that, you know, I could, I could actually go into, into one of those hulls. And in fact, I hope to be doing something similar in uh, in Gore in Dakar, maybe next month. Yeah, with uh, Ajit Prop, but actually play play these these spaces and record these spaces, you know, which which have those vibrations still inside of them, you know. Yeah. But yeah, so um, do we do we continue or do uh, or should, yeah, should no, we slip no, into uh, the actual? Well, no. What? Um, hold on, Satch. You know, I'm you know I'm kind of building up the conversation here, you know, give me a chance to... <laughs> I'm sorry, bro. You, you, you're conducting, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you're conducting, bro. Yeah. All up, you know, all up, 
All up on it. Rewind, yeah? Rewind. <laughs> Pull up. <laughs> no, so it's sad. Yeah, I mean, man. So interesting. So in a way, one of the starting points of your research, obviously, as you mentioned, in terms of the hold, but in terms of um, the work of some of the earliest recordings of African music by anthropologists like yeah. Leon Fibrinius, North Coast Thomas, Carl Lehman, and others. Um, so tell us a bit about yeah. how you discovered those archives, you know, and what was the significance okay. of those archives? All right, well, the first thing is that um, I spent quite a bit of time in London at the Royal Anthropological Institute. Um, I was already um, very aware of Emil Torde, who um, was, was in that first generation of anthropologists, but Torde actually spoke seven of the local Congolese languages. And um, we see from um, John Mack's book, who was the keeper of the, uh, the African collection at the, the British Museum, um, there's actually photos of, of Torde, you know, with the phonogram machine. So mm. I, was, I thought that, well, after reading something, quite a few things about Frobenius and his very aggra aggressive approach, that I was on a quest to find Torde's wax cylinders. And I hunted high and low, but didn't find them, unfortunately. Um, then <laughs> um, entered the um, Berlin Phonograph Archive, where, um, which is the oldest uh, phonogram archive you know, on the planet, and uh, discovered uh, Frobenius's recordings. And Carla Mann, who was a Swedish um, missionary, but was, um, was again a linguist. He, he wrote the, uh, the essential Kuba dictionary, which still exists now. So he was, he, he and, and I spent quite a long time in, in that archive. Um, What's very important to, to, to mention here is that we're at the advent of sound technology. Mm. And what one hears on a wax cylinder is really just very, 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 very high tones. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at um, records that were made pre-technology, which is also very important because there was no electronic sounds. It was an unpolluted environment, um, but we're not actually hearing that thumbprint and we're not hearing any of the middle frequencies or the bass frequencies because a lot of, a, a lot of the music that was going on, especially at that time and especially in the Congo region, mm -hmm. were ensembles that were made up of at least 30 musicians with these like massive like log drums and everything else, you know? So there was a lot of bass frequency. So it's a very, very tiring, a very, very tiring experience to sit, um, sit and listen to these phonogram uh, ar archives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I made a selection predominantly from Frobenius and, and from, uh, from Carla Mann. And then they were digitized. Actually, the only ones that I had access to were the ones that were already digitized. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute fallacy, but the thing is that um, what, what, what's, what, it's not fallacy, a travesty, sorry. Um, all of those black cylinders are unauthored. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those wax cylinders have even been translated. You know, I was, I was absolutely amazed at that. And so that particular Berlin Phonograph archive that I visited in 2018 was in Darla, now it's in the Humboldt Forum. Um, so what happened was that I took the digital, digital copies from the wax cylinders and uh, then took those over to Luanda and had listening sessions with people like MC Sasado, Kilo Wangi was involved in that, you know, quite a lot of you know, contemporary musicians. We're going to come on to that in a minute, Satch. Before we do that, right? That's why I stopped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want I wanted to just go a bit more into, you know, the journeys in the archive. Um, I mean, Fabinius is someone. Leo Fabinius is someone that I was aware of, um, because of his writing on African culture and civilization, and and the impact mm -hmm. kind of impact of his work on people like Sheikh Anta Diop and other, you know, black researchers, you know, Du Bois and other people. Who yeah, were searching that, and it was very important. I didn't realize 
you know, um, that actually he recorded sound. I mean, that's really that's amazing. I didn't realize that at all. I mean, I've seen some images of photographs, you know, in the field of these phonograms with the big horn literally in front exactly, of the yeah. musicians. Can you maybe just kind of paint that for us? A little bit that those scenes what would okay. it be like i will do do those recordings and well they're recording individuals were they recording orchestras groups of people what was the what were the kinds of just give us a well they were they, recording. yeah they were record they 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 would record they would record individuals if they wanted to like record uh individual instruments but oftentimes they were as i've said before recording these orchestras but because of the the um the lack of technology they weren't able to get or capture, to use a word, capture most of, of, of the sonics, most of the frequencies, because you had to stand directly in front of the horn. And so, yeah, we, we it's again, with, with, a lot of, with a lot of our history and a lot of, a, a lot of our cultures, it's left to our imagination to, mm. to wonder what was, what was really, really going on. So there was um, an erasure such there was a kind of a, a form of erasure that well was yeah there was there was an there was an erasure before the process of recording it was like a an edit which yeah. we will never ever hear because because of the lack of technology and and also we have to think about the period that these recordings that i took back when when they were recorded and were, were in the midst of leopold's congo belge mm -hmm. so yeah. Uh, uh, th those performers were recording under great duress. Yeah, you know. So they, you, we, know we, have to, we have to we have to ask yeah. that was. So, so yeah. you know, when when we're looking at technology and we're saying that um, the phonogram was the slave of the anthropologist, then what was the performer? What position was the performer in? And what was the performer? A lot of times, what was the performer singing, or what didn't he sing in the in those silent spaces between the notes that he did some, sing? Mm. So this is what this is what's very very interesting for me as well. Those those gaps, those like Miles Davisian gaps, mm. you know, because that I can is, just yeah. imagine, and I and I really wanted to, I wanted to, I really wanted Torday's recordings because of the fact that he did speak the language, and you can just see from. Or a few languages, and you can see from his whole posture in photographs that he seemed to be a much humbler person. You know, and I, I just—it's so sad that we can't we can't hear those recordings. But the ones we have, we have. Yeah, I mean, Fred Fred Moten talks about the idea of non-performance, and I wonder about what the non-performances yeah. might have been of those people. You know, would they have? You know, they might have. They may have been withholding deliberately certain sounds or no certain... they were with i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure they were withholding deliberately i'm sure that they were um you know there's there's certain there would have been certain chants that would have only been able to have been sung in the presence of maybe elders you know there's yeah. there's you know it, it breaks down to into into very hierarchical things as well with with with, with, with it within the different cultures you know yeah um but for sure, there's a lot of stuff that um, that wasn't recorded, and um, you know there was there, there's like a lot of instruments that are not around. I tried to get into the Mac um, Museum in Hamburg. Well, I didn't try. I did. I was invited, and um, I wanted to actually see the instruments that um, from the from the Frobenius collection because they're mm -hmm. housed there but they're housed in some warehouse and they couldn't find them. But I'm sure that those are the instruments that were used in the performances that um, Frobenius mm. uh, recorded. Mm. Um, you know, that will, come at a, that will come at a later stage. But um, I have, you know, I have a look. Let me show you right here, one second. I was about to ask you, because I know that you have a collection, Satch. I was about to ask you. Yeah, about. so. So 
when we go into the sonics of this, is that's like a 19th century chokwe, um, la melophone, or kisanji. Um, the sonics that were going on at that time, pre-synthesizer, this thing sounds like a synthesizer. And then you've got like this one, where you've got purposefully distortion. There you go, that's a little, a little, little example. I'm, you know, we could have a, we could have a whole talk on, on instruments because I've got loads of them in the back room, which yeah. I, I collect. Oftentimes in Belgian flea markets, you know, I wonder why I can find them in the Belgian flea markets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating, it's a, it's a really fascinating and, and, and deep subject, just, just the instruments themselves. And, yeah. um, you know, these, 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 these resonance boxes of resonance, mm. you know, is, mm. is, is, is what's always what's always amazing me. The, the sounds that people were actually mm. um, using, you know, mm. within, with, within their music, and then the the, the inc inclusion of everybody. You know, you see you see these these pictures um, uh, in in certain books of just like the whole village at some point, just like with rattles and and everything else and you know kids joining in you know vocally yeah. and everything yeah. else so we get we get we get smatterings of that in these in these phonograph uh, phonogram, uh recordings but yeah still a lot is left to the imagination and Sats, what about the photographs because there are photographs of those encounters or at least um images of i've seen images of the musicians standing you know in front of the yeah yeah. I mean, where do those, where do those, where are those images? Are they, are they, are they part of the, are they part of the archive? You or could, you have to go to other sources. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, well, to find those, I mean, I would, you know, especially with, with the tour day uh, material, uh, there's an extensive um, archive at the uh, Royal Anthropology Institute in London. Right. And then as far as, as far as uh, the actual wax cylinders or the dig digital recordings of the wax cylinders, uh, they're housed in the British Library. Yeah, yeah. So that's where, well, if, if anybody mm -hmm. wants to do any, any, any sonic research, that's where one should go in the UK. Yeah. Now Satch, you've talked about the idea of sonic restitution, which I think is a really interesting yeah. idea, given the kind of debate that's happening around restitution of objects. Right, people talking about mm. the objects that were stolen and that are now in these museums, and I think what's really fascinating yeah. about your project is that, you know, we also need to restitute or understand the sonic, the sounds, and unmute those archives, so that they're that exactly they're, that's they're, what I that's what I do. So yeah, maybe just talk a little bit about that. You know, this idea of sonic restitution. What do you mean by that, and how mm -hmm. would you achieve that? Or how are you working to achieve that? Well, can I? The thing is, um, the unmuting of the sonic archives is where Afrosonic mapping, you know, begins. Mm. Uh, and in a way, it, it, it's one of its ends. Maybe is the. Uh, I don't. I don't know whether I can. Can I use the word restitution? Because usually, restitution is from such as as uh, an official political space somebody was sent to me uh, just just two days ago can you really use the word restitution because there's nothing official about that i think that i prefer to use the word return that mm. i'm re i'm returning the sonic the 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 the, the, the sonic um thumbprint which was so very very important because um when we talk about the artifacts the artifacts were never by themselves the way that we see a mask in a museum is, is a total fallacy because a mask was seen from so many different angles because a mask was danced in and was accompanied by music. You know, so the, the, when, when, when we talk about restitutions, then it has to be costume, mask, choreography, the music, mm -hmm. the, the complete, yeah, the, 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 the complete, uh, the complete culture you know, mm. or, or the complete chapter of that particular of that particular artifact if you like mm. um 
So, so I, I'm returning them, and in in Luanda, in Angola, I I I wasn't really able to open up a conversation about if the museum would actually like, you know, to 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 have the the sonic archive, and but for sure I will be doing that on 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 the on the next one. Because I, I think there's a lot of people they're not really paying in very much attention to to how important you know this music was because hey without music you know mm -hmm. there is you no know, lot, and, and, but, and and there is no question. So but Satch, a lot of the music obviously is lost to us because as you said the recordings are very incomplete they didn't capture everything, um, yeah. and so. Um, I imagine that part of your project is, or part of your restitution or return, and the reason why you're working with contemporary musicians is to kind of give body to that. Is to is to, you know because what I'm saying is part some of it is lost, right? Or, or do you say not? Uh, so in, in a way, how do we how do so, we yeah, well, well, how do we what? how do we capture it? How do we how do we um, how do we bring it to life? And it seems to me that one way you're bringing it to life is to bring it into contemporary, is to bring it to contemporary musicians and to work. work well, with it, 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 the thing is for me is that it, 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 it never died and it was never lost because mm. it's, in, it's, it, it's, in, it's in all black music from Cuba to Jamaica, to Trinidad, to Calypso, to Rumba, don't forget that rumba was lost in the Congo and it was the Cubans that basically brought that back, you know, and, yeah. and Franco was the one that really like resuscitated the rumba. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul, if we want to study African music now, we're absolutely compelled to go to Central and South America. Mm -hmm. You know, Colombia is a great place. I, I had that experience with the Palenque, the Palenque who speak a, a strain of Bantu that doesn't exist anymore on the continent. They're mm -hmm. playing rhythms that don't exist on the continent. So we, in fact, historically, there's an equal amount. I'm not going to say more, but there's definitely an equal amount of ancient Africanness or Africanities in mm -hmm. in, 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 in in the Americas uh, than than in than, than than on the continent. Because you've got to remember that, for instance, this instrument, right, that I just played before, the lamellophone, the kisanji. I had imagined that when I when I when I when I would arrive in Luanda, I would find I would find some some players of that instrument. I didn't find anybody. No, I found one person, Cabuena, mm. and um, sorry, my phone's ringing a bit later. Cabuena, and um, he was learning to play it from Lelendo, and Lelendo had been based in Paris for the last twenty years. Mm -hmm. So. What happened, what happened to the lamellophone? I'll tell you what happened to the lamellophone. When, when, the, when the Greeks and the Belgians went into, into, um, into the Congo in Zaire, they introduced the electric guitar. So all of those cyclic um, counter rhythmic um, patterns that you hear in Congolese music now were played on the lamellophone. Yeah, so you know the question the question of the music for me actually the 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 music the music didn't die and we haven't lost it. Mm. Um, it there's there's this connection and there's this return and that's very important and in my Afrosonic mapping paintings which um, function on three on three levels as uh, as cartographic depictions as uh, well, maybe you don't want to talk about that right now. Um, <laughs> we can talk. Uh, we're going to come to that. <laughs> all on, all on. I know, all I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know. Yeah, you're go, you're going too fast. Take yeah? a chill pill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, hold on. Let me go back. This is my problem, man. This is my problem. I know, well, hold on. Like, what I was, what I was gonna, like, no, okay. So what I was going to ask you next is to kind of let's talk about the journeys that you took, right, and the the the, the geographies that you took to Luanda to um, Salvador mm. Bahia in Brazil and, and Lisbon in Portugal. Yeah. Talk a bit about that. How did that come yeah. about? Who were you want? Who did you make contact with? Um, and what did you do? Because I'm obviously part of part of what you were doing is to create new music or new musical connections. Um, and, and also, yeah. as we'll talk about in a minute, 
to make art, to make paintings, right? So we'll talk about that afterwards. But right. let's talk about these yeah. okay. these um, these these sojourns to Luanda, for example, where you use kind of hip hop technology, sampling, looping, in order to to mm -hmm. create sounds. So tell us a bit about that yeah. process. What were you okay, fine. So um, in so the first the first stop was was well from from Berlin. Then I went to um, to, to Lisbon uh, on a short on a very very short stopover where I where Johnny you know DJ Johnny Johnny Leandro he picked me up yeah. and he said my brother you're going home he so he said I'm he's so happy because the thing is we've known each other for years and we've I've always been talking about yeah I want to go to Luanda so I went and had a I had a really beautiful meal with his family and then back to the back to the airport and then on the plane. Um, I traveled with, um, obviously with the, with, with the digital recordings. And then on, on arriving in Rwanda, I did have a Goethe Institute um, connection. And I stayed with uh, jo uh, Johnny's sister uh, in Sao Paulo, which is quite close to San Benzanga, as you know. And, um, you know, of course, my first thing was, okay, who can I connect with? You know, who, what musicians can I meet? You know, what thinkers can mm -hmm. I meet? Um, and so the first part, the, you know, the first couple of days, I had, I, 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 I made contact with uh, MC Sasadot, uh, Kilowanji, who was there, um, Kilowanji Kiyahenda, and um, made a trip out to Sambizanga and took the recordings with me on my hard disk and um and we chose we chose 11 11 recordings you know of of Leman Bauman and, and Prebenius which were turned into four by loops which is the, the normal uh methodology of, of of hip hop in fact but we didn't do hip hop i mean that should be that should also be made clear and um started building tracks in, in that particular studio. Um, mm -hmm. the, so what was going on there was with, 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 the, with, with, the, with the four bar loops of the uh, original uh, phonogram recordings, beeps were created, uh, beeps and bass lines. And then from there, went to uh, Studio Vial which is in the asphalt side of Luanda, you know, very, very chic state-of-the-art studio, amazing. And uh, I'd invited uh, MC Chris, um, who's a, yeah, she's a, she's, she's a kudarista like Sasadot. Sasadot, she came uh, by Sasadot. And um, I asked Sasadot and Chris to write lyrics. And so, and, and I, I did say, okay, you know, we we're very much looking at, you know, Angola's, Angola's history. Um, you know, you've got carte blanche, uh, just, you know, yeah. come up with some great stuff. And they did, they, come up with some, they came up with some really great stuff. Um, so uh, before they spat their lyrics on the tracks, I'd gone to see some very cheesy concert Mm -hmm. just a little way outside of Luanda mm -hmm. and uh, it was a big it was a big band lots of different singers nearly kind of cabaret-esque I was kind of amazed and um, there was a guitarist in there and I was I said who is that guitarist you know because it was this you're just hearing all of these like Collie's licks and kind of James Brown kind of licks and everything else and uh, I tracked him down Teddy and Singy legendary guitarist and uh, he played amazing guitar on all the tracks, you know, quite a few different guitar tracks. And uh, then Chris did her lyrics, Sacerdote did, did his lyrics. I mean, Sacerdote on hearing the, um, on hearing the original, um, you know, wax cylinder recordings, like he was nearly in tears. And because his parents moved from like very close to Zaire, because you know, there's a lot of uh, Angolans that they, of course, Angola is the Congo, but then, a lot of them are, are from actually like around Zaire and everywhere. Um, 
and uh, Teddy and Singy, because he's older, he really recognized like a, a lot of the beats on the wax cylinders, you know, and he could, he even located them to certain areas in the Congo. So it was a, you know, very moving and very emotional uh, a process. Um, so, do you want to then? Sorry, I was going to say, do you want to, you mentioned about the asphalt and I know that you kind of, one way of mapping Luanda, the city, is between the yeah. dust region and the asphalt. Can you maybe just say a little bit about yeah. that division between the dust and the asphalt and how that translates musically as well? Okay. Um, well, let's let's go to the dust first. Yeah. Um, you know, with 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 the, with the various uprisings and the political climate, a lot of people from the rural areas moved moved into Luanda or all the way from like the sixties, as you know, and. Uh, Still, to this very day, a lot of a lot of these uh, musekes or favelas, you know, but they're called musekes in 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 Luanda, uh, do not have running water. Some have electricity, but a lot of the times people are just like getting their electricity from the telegraph poles. Mm -hmm. um, but there's such a beautiful culture going on, you know, throughout all of that poverty, and Sasado has has this like, you know, small studio, but he's mentoring like a lot of, lot of people to become DJs and producers and kuduristas and so on and so forth. Kudurista is somebody who make, who, who performs kuduro music. Um, you, you leave Sambizanga and then you go in towards the asphalt and the first bit of asphalt you, you come across is San Paolo, where there's a big market and it's still very rootsy and everything else. But then you go, you go a little bit further and you're in a very westernized Luanda, um, which is the asphalt side, bourgeois. Uh, Semba. Yeah, like, I mean, where where, Semba music. Sorry? Semba music. Yeah. Sam, oh, you, oh, you want to talk about sem, Semba music? Well, um, I wasn't going to. No, I didn't say Semba music. But the, uh, if we if we talk about the difference between the musics, yeah, I don't know. Kudu, Kuduro was obviously born out of the Masekis. Yeah, that's what I meant. That, that you know, like yeah, like hip hop, what you know, wasn't born in Beverly Hills. The you know? Semba was, was born was in the Bronx, from, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you mentioned about the getting the electricity from the you know from the pipes and you know from the that sounded just like South the Bronx telegraph poles in the nineteen seventies. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's but very very much what Semba. what's it about? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but but then Semba is 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 more related to a kind of. Uh, I don't know whether I can really, really like talk so much about Semba music, to be very honest with you. I mean, it 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 has a it has a rural quality to it, but then there's also Portuguese elements to it as well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's not it it's not it's definitely not as urban and it's definitely not as raw yeah. as, uh, yeah. as 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 Kuduro. So what was the kind of um... What was the outcome of that? What 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 what's what you know? You produced some work with um, in San Paziga, um with the MC. Yeah. What kind of stuff came out of that in the end? And what? How did you incorporate that into your project? Well, no wonder was the first stop, and then we went went, went to Salvador the the Bahia, and um, I worked with the uh, Suya Nacimiento. Who actually studied? Who actually studied music in California, mm -hmm. and um, she's an experimental guitarist. Um, so added her to um, well, actually created a track. I I did this one bass and, and basically bass line and a beat, and then she played guitar on top of that, um, and then um, we did another track in Brazil, and then from there. Went to uh, went went to Lisbon, where I did a bit more recording, and then then the rest was um, a few more a few a, a few changes to the, some of the recordings. Uh, added added some horns and stuff here. Um, I mixed it, I mixed it here, and it's an album, and it's ready to go. I mean, I I just haven't been able to find a label for it. Yeah. But also within that recording process, I also created a, a solo, much more experimental album. 
called latitude, which is, yeah, as I say, it's, it's an experimental one because, because Afrosonic mapping <laughs> is songs. Um, it was agreed by the house culture and the belt who, who um, created, you know, helped help this to become a reality, this, this, this whole project yeah. in Berlin that um, along with the exhibition would be performances and talks. And well, so right. uh, everybody that worked on the album was invited to, to Berlin and yeah. we had uh, three performances and uh, we, we actually um, aired the interviews mm -hmm. and um, had extensive talks. So, let's so talk Afrosonic mapping, you yeah. know, yeah. sorry? No, I was going to say, so let, let's, um, as, you, as you kind of talk about the exhibition, one of the amazing parts of the exhibition, so unfortunately I didn't get a chance to see it, but I've seen the images on the website, you know, what dominates the space yeah. are the paintings, these huge large scale paintings, some of which are perhaps on the wall behind you, I don't know, but um, maybe you can start to just talk about. Yeah, well, this is, the, this, is, this is the more recent one, so you can see that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe you can just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how how that how this research you did in these different locations in the archives. How did that feed into the paintings? What were you trying to do with the paintings? Maybe just kind of talk through a little bit about yeah. the process of the paintings. Yeah, well, you know, as I said, the paint the paintings act as cartographic depictions. They also act as unfixed graphic scores. And um, celestial constellations. So those are the three elements that I wanted to bring into in, in the three layers that I wanted to bring into the paintings. Mm. Um, those, those cartographic depictions aren't always exactly Cabinda and, uh, and Salvador de Bahia. You know, there's, there's, there's still a lot of imagination left in the, in the same way that there's so much imagination that has to be applied into the into the listening of the uh, of the wax cylinders, mm. but very important very important for me is um, with the paintings the the idea of the return, the idea that the music goes out to the Caribbean basin and the Americas, but it also comes back, and uh, to this very day there's this constant connection you know between you know grime and uh, dub and reggae and funk and hip hop and you know the way that Africa then reinterprets that and then the way that you know we've reinterpreted or we pull we pull it out of ourselves so it's just this like this continuous this this continuous flow and I'm very much trying to depict that I, I try to depict that in the paintings um this is not this is not the best painting behind me this is not the best painting to actually show that yeah but um there's, there's paintings where we very, very see, clearly see these two continents, yeah. the Americas and the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. And we see the, the, flow, the, the flow of the music where in fact, I'm actually like oftentimes just like throwing the paint on because I paint on the floor and on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, there's often, you know, these octave balls which are also a, a very important part. And on this painting, you can kind of see these vertical lines, mm. which also act, act, act as a grid, act a bit like a musical stave as well. Yeah. So um, the, 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 the paintings, the paintings are, are working as these, as these maps, depic depicting, depicting the routes, mm -hmm. but they can also be played. And it's, it's not in any, kind of uh, Western methodology that they're being played. I'm actually, because of being with Burnt Sugar for like 20 years and working under the baton of Butch Morris, mm -hmm. I'm applying some of Butch Morris's um, baton, hand and baton um, depictions, movements. Um, so I pull together a quite small ensemble of like eight musicians for the House Kutcher on the Velt uh, mm -hmm. exhibition. Mm -hmm. And um, literally played two paintings or I interpreted those paintings and then with certain symbols that I was given to the musicians, they were then reinterpreting. So it's this relay from, from me initially painting 
the music on the canvas to then re rereading what I've painted, interpreting that, and then relaying it to the musicians, and then the musicians relaying it out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's that process. Right. I mean, but you will never, you will never, but you will never ever hear. If I played this painting behind me, you'll never ever hear it same the same twice. Sure, sure. I mean, for me, a lot of the paint, you know, much is the paintings for me are about intensities, different intensities, yeah, flows of energy, sound um, mm -hmm. exchanges. I really, I was really interested in the way that they were almost stacked in the in the installation in the house to come in the house to come yeah they're and sat like speakers like, exactly like sound systems yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, a sound uh, system uh, that's what uh, i wanted them to be i wanted them to be like sound systems that you could you could you could hear them you know that you stood in front of them and you could hear it you know that you could you you, you weren't getting that sub vertebrae shake that you would in front of a, a of a sound system but you you definitely were get sound you know yeah. so yeah in that way they, they they were very they were very very successful but they 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 don't need to be stacked and, and they and they still work as as individual paintings but yeah Paz Guevara and myself we came up with that idea of yeah. like how do we exhibit paintings in a unorthodox way if you like yeah. and, and, and and that's what we came up with and it really worked. They also yeah. seem to me to be like a vortex you know like almost like a vortex okay sound where you have these different points because you had in the middle you had the interview didn't you and then um, yeah yeah we had we had yeah. this listening this listening podium points yeah 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 so it's it's kind of like a spaceship you know because i mean afrosonic mapping as, as well it's not it's not afro afrofuturism because it's based in it very much in fact rather than in in, in imagination but there's a lot yeah. of imagination within afrosonic mapping so so there is this like spiritual otherworldly uh thing going on with it and that I, and i think that where i'm able to really employ that is is in the paintings because yes. i mean most people that look at the paintings that that know say oh that's very afrofuturist or you know they they they, they, they immediately they immediately take them to that place you know kind of yeah. a sunrise-esque place yeah but you know in, in also in, in talking about the music just going back for a quick minute you yeah. know, when I said that the music's not not lost, um, I think that you know Kendrick Kendrick Lamar's um, uh, "How to Pimp a Butterfly." I mean, I hear so much Congo in that in that in that album. Mm. You know, I'm just I'm, I'm hearing so much uh, 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 Congo in, in in a lot of the grime that's coming out of London. You know, mm. Mm. I mean, it's it's it it, it it's it, it's it's it's, it's it's got a certain angst that comes about from mm -hmm. from not being the predominant culture within within a country. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in, in Africa, there's a there's a, a you know you've been to Africa, you know there's just this mm -hmm. kind of like much more relaxed thing going on, you know. Um, but we can't be relaxed in the states, and we can't be relaxed in the UK. Can't be relaxed anywhere or, or in, mm. in, in, in in Europe, really. But the the Africanity, the Afrosonic signifier, is it's it it's just it's in this circulatory space, which just keeps going round and round and round and round. Like I said, it, for me, it's very very important that return, you know, and acknowledging Satch, that return. Yeah, no, Satch. How important would you say is your Caribbean or Jamaican roots in the framing of this project? Because it seems to me that, you know, Jamaican culture, sound system culture, yeah. is almost central yeah. for any kind of Afrosonic mapping. Totally, totally, it, it is. And, and, and it's in there <laughs> very, very strongly. I mean, I remember as a youth, you know, going to Shabins and Blues and, you know, just, up against the wall and just completely in the sound, you know. In the wall, eh? So that's that. that I'm that, going to ask about them once. You know? <laughs> <laughs> in the grove, man. You know. So I mean, the thing is that, yeah, that's that's my grounding. That's my groundation. You know, um, it's it, it's it's very very much there. And this year, I'm going to be doing the um, 
the Kingston Biennial. They, they want my uh, Celestial Vessel piece, you know, which is the ship made out of the red vinyl records yeah. in the National Gallery. So I'm, I'm, on, I'm honored about that. But for sure, you know, of course, J Jamaica, the Caribbean, it, it, it's very, very much in there, you know, very, yeah. very, very much in, in, in the Afrosonic mapping. And, and I would definitely include Jamaica in the Anglophone mapping that I hope to do. You know, uh, yeah. Jamaica and Nigeria, you yeah. know, you know, because because as well, you know, we know, you know, when we went to school, you know, it was Jamaicans, Trinidadians, Ghanaians and Nigerians, you know, that I mean, those were those were the main, you know, black cultures that, 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 were, that were going on at the same yeah. time. So, uh, you know, I my my introduction to um, African music as well was was very, very early. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. You know, so you, before, you anticipated, before King Sunday, yeah. You anticipated Sorry? my, you anticipated my sort of final question as we round up, is um, about where yeah. the project goes now. Um, and you've got a, you've got an incredible amount of material. You've got research material. You've got the blog, which itself is a, a really, you yeah. know, a really rich source. Yeah, we didn't talk about the blog. Yeah, do you, do you want to talk yeah. about that? I mean, the, the, blog, the, the blog, I think, is well, really yeah, the blog is very important. Yeah, the blog is really important because actually, uh, in tandem to the um, to the phonograph archive um, period, we also created a blog that was decided. Uh, that was, yeah, and some Franca, who's the the art director of the visual arts at House Culture and the Vault, Paz Guevara, the, the curator, and myself said, mm -hmm. "Yeah, let's let's." Before we actually go out there and, and, and do and, and do and do the mapping, let's prepare the terrain, so to speak. And so the, the blog was created. And on, on the blog, there's a lot of like historical information, even like historical facts about the phonograph um, uh, machine created by Thomas Edison, 1889, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, various interviews that I was doing with people from the from the region uh, and also uh, from the diaspora. So it's always, it's always kind of like, you know, diaspora and continent together. Um, and I would do the same. I think the methodology is, is, is firmly in place for, for, um, for, for future mappings. I mean, and those, those future mappings uh, would be most definitely the, uh, the Anglophone and the Francophone and maybe the Hispanophone but definitely Anglophone and, and Francophone. And um, as I said before, Jamaica, you know, Jamaica, Trinidad, Nigeria, Ghana would definitely be uh, very important in the, in the Anglophone. Yeah, um, watch, watch those phones, um, Satch, they're very close. I know, I know, I, ju I, just, I just turned my phone off. <laughs> yeah, no, what I meant is <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know, but the thing is that I, I'm using I'm using the phone on purpose, but I could just say the English, the French, or the Spanish mapping as well. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um you know? no, well, listen, a really rich conversation. Um I think um I think the project is incredible. It's 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 obviously has you know it it can just go it can be ongoing. It's like a life work, I can imagine, Satch, for you. It, uh, is. It, it is, yeah. it is, it is, it is, because there's so much, there's so, so much going on. And every time I decide to go back into it, I just realize how many, how many things I haven't included and how very little I actually know, you yeah. know, and that's what's really amazing. I and mean, it's just, yeah. it's such a challenge. And like you were saying, it's, a, it, you know, about the, the idea of like the lack or the breaks or the spaces and not really been able to hear the music and having to imagine. And then, yeah. you know, uh, you know, Louis Trude Sokai, you know, he's, he's a friend of mine, a recent yeah. friend of mine since Afrosonic mapping. Yeah. So, you know, we have great discussions, you know, yeah. Yeah. so it's, yeah, it's, it's about constantly reaching out to people. Yeah. <laughs> he's great. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. in the book. Louis Trude Sokai, Jamaican and Nigerian, man. You're going to get right. deeper than That's that, right? right? <laughs> So we yeah. got to, we got in fact, to... in fact, Paul, you're the you're you're the one who introduced me to his book, Sound Culture. You're the one who introduced me. Thank yeah, you. I remember. I remember talking about that with you. Um, so we we've got yeah, to we've got to, we've got to find a way of getting it to the UK. Definitely. Yeah. I'm yeah, well, I definitely want to. And I mean, it, it needs to be the uh, UK needs to like. Absolutely. Yeah, the the UK the UK needs to look at its um 
it's it, it, it's colonial narrative, you know, from from the sonic perspective, you know, because yeah. it's not just focused on obduracies, you know, yeah. it's yeah. it's it's very much focused on the genius out of obduracy that was that was created and still exists. Yeah, beautiful. Couldn't have ended in a better way, Satch. Always a pleasure to talk to you, sir. All right. An ongoing conversation. You too, my brother.